Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. Uh, I've made it home. Unfortunately, Kendall has not yet. Um, and I wanted to just give you guys some updates on Kendall and why she is in the hospital so much longer than any of us anticipated she might be. We also just got the biopsy results yesterday, so I wanted to share some of that information with you as well. And hopefully, Kendall makes it home before the end of this video. So Kendall's been in the hospital for 12 days now, which is like probably seven days longer than anyone probably anticipated she would be there. I came home yesterday because I had some business stuff I had to tend to, and so Brandy is up there with her now. And the reports from her today have been super promising, so we're all like on pins and needles really hoping that she gets discharged and that they get to make their way home. Before I get into some of these updates, there's something I've noticed recently as I've edited these videos from time to time, and it's harder for me to watch these videos as I edit them um, than it is to see these transitions or transformations in Kendall in real life. And there's a valuable lesson in this, so hear me out. You get so caught up um, in my case, you know, taking care of Kendall and you're so close to, to the thing that you don't really see the transformation happening like in front of your eyes. For example, last week I showed this clip in this video and I was saying how good she looked. She was sitting up, she was awake and kind of alert and communicating with us and I just, she just seemed so much better than she did 24 hours ago where she was barely awake from anesthesia and, you know, couldn't get out of bed or was hardly communicating with us. And as I watch it back and I'm like, what are you talking about? She looks, she does not look that great. And we have a long road ahead of us. And this is something that I keep noticing in the videos when I edit them. And it just, two things. One, it makes me really appreciate the fact that I'm documenting this for ourselves uh, and for Kendall. And it really reminds us of how incredible Kendall is and like how, how much she's overcoming and where she's what she's going through and getting getting through. Um, but more importantly, it's a reminder, and this is where I think the lesson comes in and I wanna share it with you guys. This is the same thing that happens to a lot of people when you're really close to them and you don't notice them getting sick slowly over time. It's why a lot of cases you're like, when you catch it, it's really bad and you don't notice it because you're either looking at yourself and you don't see yourself getting bad or you know it's a parent and you see your kids every day and you don't realize it until someone else sees that person and it's the first time they've seen them in a month or several weeks or a few months and they look really bad and you don't notice it and then you kind of look back or you get it dealt with or they bring it to your attention and you're like oh wow, they do look really bad. How did I miss this? And that's one of the things that was brought up to us when Kendall was originally diagnosed, that oftentimes it is a grandparent or a babysitter or somebody who doesn't see the kid frequently will catch the, the cancer or whatever the thing is because they notice the change and they're not with them every day. So let this be my little public service announcement to say something, to bring something up to somebody if they don't look right, if they don't look well, don't be afraid to offend somebody. You, you might just save their life. So after surgery, she was in a good bit of pain, right? Like that makes sense. She had a major surgery. It was like four or five hour surgery. They cut her abdomen wide open. They mobilized a lot of her intestines, meaning they moved a lot of stuff out of the way to try to access the lymph nodes that they were trying to remove. And they close her back up and then she's in pain. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Of course she would be in pain, right? But after several days of this, where it continued to like really be high levels of pain, uh, which is one of the things that kept us in the ICU for those extra few days, um, and they were like keeping a close eye on things because even they were like, this doesn't seem quite right. But eventually they were like, okay, this is sort of normal. Everything looks good. You're, you know, all your vitals look great. Like we're gonna send you guys back upstairs to your normal floor and let you continue to recover up there, which is great. But eventually as it continued to go on day after day, to me, it just didn't, something wasn't adding up to me. It didn't seem right. And I started to wonder like, is there something else we're missing is something being overlooked, like something something just isn't quite right. So I started to kind of collect my own data, starting to really pay attention to when these things are happening. 
um, asking her more questions and, and all those kinds of things, right? And what I noticed is that she would be in pain every time she peed. And not like getting up to pee or walking to the bathroom, but every time she peed. And looking back, this sort of seems obvious, right? Like she would get up, she would pee, she would be in pain, she'd get back in bed, we'd ask for morphine, and she'd be good for like six hours until she got up to pee again, and then she'd be in pain and we'd get morphine again. But it wasn't until I was like really data logging this and realizing that it wasn't right before she peed, it wasn't sitting up to pee, it wasn't walking to the bathroom, it was when she peed and after that the pain set in and we had to get it corrected with morphine. It was the only way to get that under control, just sobbing and tears, like pain cranked up to 11 pain. And it was really awful to watch and witness and have to see her go through that, especially after we picked up on the pattern and knowing that she had to go to the bathroom. You, I knew it and she knew it that she was about to be in a lot of pain and there was really nothing we could do about it until we sort of came up with some sort of answer as to what in the world is going on. So I take all my findings, I present it to the doctors, not really present it, but I, you know, I brought it up to the doctors and the nurses like, hey, here's what I've noticed over the last handful of times she's gone to the bathroom that I've asked you for morphine. This is the pattern that I've started to, to, uh, to show and, and, and what I'm seeing here. So then I'm asking myself, you know, could she have a bladder infection or a kidney infection or a kidney stone, or could she have some sort of adhesion, which is like scar tissue um, on her bladder that as it contracts is pulling on something that's causing this great pain? Because the pain was actually in her side. It wasn't really in the front where they cut her, where the incision was, which is one of the things to me was like, this just isn't right. And it was only opposite side of the lymph nodes they removed. So again, things just weren't adding up. And I was there to try to prove out other things, to try to eliminate the possibility of other problems so that the things that they said were normal to me seemed like, okay, we can explain this away as something that's normal, but it just continued to not add up. And this is one of the first times that what so many people told me initially when she was first diagnosed was um, you have to be your own advocate. And it's like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, what does that, what does that really even mean? But this is the first time it like really clicked for me. And none of this is meant to sound like the doctors don't know what they're doing or it's a bad hospital or any of those types of things or there are the nurses or anything like that. But you're an extra set of eyes. Like they're only as good as the information they have. And you know, me being with my child, I'm in there with her 24 seven. So I'm seeing every little thing that happens. And if I can make notes on that, relay that information and give them more information to try to research or make decisions with or better understand the problem, um, it, it helps everybody. So, you know, being your own advocate, like really asking those questions, really, um, what if this, uh, could it be that, um, hey, you know, it's not really coming from the incision, it's actually coming from the side. Those types of pieces of information that make them go, you know what, maybe you're right, maybe it could be something else. So pay close attention and bring things up if things don't seem quite right. So after I told them all of the things that I started to notice, they agreed that it didn't quite seem normal like post-op type of issues to them. So they did a urinalysis, they did x-rays, and all of that stuff came back as normal and looked fine. But one doctor did say that it could be bladder spasms, so they said let's try a muscle rack relaxer, and that would both help the abdominal pain from the healing. If it's, if it's tight, if it's causing her pain there, it would relax those abdomen muscles that they had to cut through. It would also relax the bladder and keep it from having these spasms if in fact that was what was going on. And either way, uh, it was worth trying that it couldn't really hurt anything to try. And it seemed better for a day, like maybe, but it really kind of continued to be a problem. So I brought it up again the next day and they continued to do tests and I just kept questioning things, trying to rule things out. What if it was this? What if it was that? So they did um, a urine culture, which is slightly different from a urinalysis. It just shows different things. It shows if there's like bacteria um, in the urine and they put it into a culture in a lab, but it takes like 24 to 48 hours to get results from that. 
They also did an ultrasound to rule out anything else because they said, are we sure it couldn't be a kidney stone? And they looked again at x-rays. Again, they did this ultrasound, just like looking for any little thing that it might be. Meanwhile, she continued to get morphine like every time she was going to the bathroom just to kind of keep her from being in so much pain. And because this continued, they decided to go ahead and try another drug that was more specific to bladder spasms. And after a few doses of that building up in her system, it really seemed to start helping her. So it's been a few days now, and according to Brandy's most recent uh, reports to me today, I'm happy to say that she has not had morphine in a little over 24 hours now. So we're really feeling optimistic that she'll be coming home. That was literally the only thing that's been keeping her in the hospital all these extra days is her having to continue to take the morphine. Now, was it bladder spasms? Was it normal post-op pain? Who knows? I mean, I have a pretty good feeling that maybe it was the bladder spasms and who knows how long that pain would have had continued to go on had I not really been being Kendall's advocate and really paying attention and asking those questions and pushing the doctors to think a little harder um, and paying attention to the little details and bringing that information to them. Mama. Who's home? Hannah, who is that? Mama. Is that Mama and Kendall? Mama. Okay. Hey, beautiful. Hi. Oh, hi. I missed you so much. How are you? Good. You look amazing. Like, for real this time. Yeah, she looks really good. I thought you looked good the other day, and I looked back at the footage, and I was like, oh, she didn't look so great. Now, you look awesome. Like a million bucks. <laughs> look at that smile. What's up, beautiful? Hi. How are you? Good. Hi. All right, Kendall, give me the update. How are you feeling? Good. Yeah, no more pain? Mm -mm. Good. When's the last time you had morphine? Do you know? It's been a while? Awesome. Like two days or something. Yeah? Look at Packy. Did, you, did he see you yet? Packy! I love that new shirt, too. Me looks, too. Looks good. Man, it sure is nice to have everyone back together all under one roof. If you're paying very close attention and you've been following for a while, you might notice that this is a new patio. This was installed while we were at the hospital. So this is like, I just saw this for the first time like yesterday. And I think it's great. We have a lot of finished work to do, but fire pit's got to get wrapped up. We've got to get some furniture out here. We've got a little, little mock-up of what we think we might do, so we gotta find some, gotta find some stuff. But Kendall is inside doing her thing, just hanging out, enjoying some time back at home, chilling on the couch, doing Kendall things. Hi, Hannah. Hi. You wanna come say hi? Say. <laughs> Are you being a wild child today? Yeah. Indeed. Indeed she is. She has been a wild child. Will you sit with me for a second? Will you be cool? Mm -hmm. Okay. Promise? Give me a high five. No. Okay. Okay, let's talk about this biopsy and the results from that. Uh, what she said is that the results from her lymph node, you know, they tried to remove but couldn't, uh, is that it is mostly differentiated. And basically what that means is that it's mostly matured or dead, more or less. Um, there's differentiated and undifferentiated, and once it's once it has differentiated, meaning it's morphed or changed or matured, it can no longer do that. So that's a good sign. That's good news. There's a lot of like technical jargon in the differentiated thing, but basically it just means it's it's mostly dead. So my big question is like, how do we move forward from here, knowing it's dead and it hasn't shrunk? you know, even though it's responded to some of these treatments uh, a bit, like what are the next steps so that she can get back to eating and that sort of thing. And 
that is still an unknown. They have a few ideas. They're not quick to say like, well, this is what we're gonna do. We have some additional scans coming up next week, another MIBG scan. There's another PET scan. There's all the stuff. I'm gonna collect all of this most recent data, the scans, the biopsy stuff. They are waiting on some sequencing, which is the thing that they really need to tell us if they're gonna do additional treatments on it. Um, to try to shrink it with chemo, like what chemo do they need to use specifically and that sort of thing. So it's gonna be probably at least two weeks before we know what the next like treatment steps are. Like we know the next step is scans. We just don't know what things look like after that. So we are anxiously waiting for the tumor board to get together to meet about this and to come up with a plan that hopefully we all feel good and confident about. So that pretty much wraps things up. Um, again, I can't thank you guys enough for continuing to watch. <laughs> uh, during the day, I got an email notification saying that the Brody Bunch channel has hit a million views, which is really cool. So I just wanted to say thank you guys all so much for watching and following Kendall's journey because most of those views are from Kendall and not many from our previous videos before Kendall. Um, but we're, we're glad you're here and supporting and part of Team Kendall. So anyways, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. And hopefully next week we have some more information. See you guys then. Peace.